In 2008, a school resource officer at Penn High School discovered a freshman discussing his support and sympathies with the Columbine shooters. Further investigation revealed that student was tied up at an email exchange, one that plotted a shooting event in the spirit of the Columbine massacre right here in Michiana. News Center 16's Trisha Hart delved deeper into the case. At the time, very few details surfaced because the perpetrator was a juvenile. The student was only 16 years old at the time, a freshman at Penn High School. But with his permission, Russell Frantum agreed to release his name for this story. It's a case that made national headlines. It also came together in a relatively short time frame. An unrelated threat on a bathroom wall raised a red flag, but it was a school resource officer who discovered another, more serious threat on a MySpace page just days later. Within 48 hours, investigators put together their case from the initial MySpace comment to a full-blown charge of conspiracy to commit murder. It was 2008 the very year MySpace would lose its number one ranking among social media platforms. But at the time, hundreds of Penn High School students still shared photos and adolescent thoughts on the site. Amid the countless postings, one in particular stood out. Dated 6.03 p.m. April 8, 2008. I wish it would really happen. The person would be a hero like Eric Harris and Dylan Claybold of Columbine. The author, Russell, a 16-year-old from South Bend. When did you realize this was a serious threat to look at? For Eric Tamashaski and Mitch Kaiser, the law and order behind the cybercrime case. It's alarming to hear anyone that it doesn't matter if they're 16. There was never any doubt from the first MySpace post brought to their attention that something was brewing. There's always a large split between, you know, we don't want to create a star chamber and penalize people for thought crimes. But then again, conspiracies are very dangerous, they're very deadly, and they give people confidence they otherwise wouldn't have. They assembled their case quickly, less than 48 hours, in fact, looking at evidence gathered on MySpace, in Russell's locker, emails, and at his home. I needed an agreement. I needed him to agree with at least a person, known or unknown, that they were going to do something like this, break the school shooting record, coordinate their parties, and then after that, I needed him to have done something in furtherance of it. With the help of forensic detectives, they found that agreement online. Investigators discovered a thread of emails between Russell and a MySpace user by the name of Dylan and Eric fought back for us. The man's profile listed himself as a 31-year-old from Lakewood, Ohio. The two talked in code, referring to their plan as a party and weapons as party favors. Police learned the identity of this mysterious MySpace user, and yes, he really was an adult from a Cleveland suburb. Before even talking to Billy online, a handwritten notebook revealed the team was plagued by a series of dark thoughts. At one point, he wrote, I wish I could shoot up the school and get away with it and still get my national recognition. But that's crazy. I'd never, ever do that. When you start talking about school shooters, we can't not take it seriously. We have to. He continued to write about violent thoughts, eventually mentioning the catastrophic plot of a friend. From the prosecutor's side, I never thought I'd have to decide whether to charge a kid with conspiracy to commit murder. It was more of a Caddyshack Judge Smales type of analysis, not a, this is going to be put on my desk and I'm really going to have a central role in. Do we charge him and if so, with what? Russell's communication with Billy continued in the following days. Under the instant messenger screen name Reb and Vodka, a combination of the Columbine shooter's aliases, Russell and Billy continue to talk about their plan. How far down the rabbit hole do you want to go, Billy wrote. I would be willing to go all the way. They used the terms sacrifice. Russell suggesting at one point, maybe this should be a two-place incident. Billy later replied, yes, it would be absolutely unique to society then. And so they settled on September 11th, 2008 for a simultaneous attack at two separate locations. I wouldn't turn back now, Russell wrote. Neither will I. We are now bound together by fate and a shared rage against an unjust system. Theory becomes reality when you agree with another guy with military experience and explosives training to coordinate joint attacks on an iconic date like September 11th. Police searched Russell's home and found his room littered with serial killer paraphernalia. A display with an odd assortment of items, Chucky dolls, the crocodile hunter, a face mask and weapons. They confiscated several illegal snakes, over 100 knives. 
A search into his computer files was even more telling. His history showed a Google search about how to make a propane bomb, the same explosive that failed to detonate at Columbine. He was basically looking for directions on how to do Columbine in a way that didn't fail. There it was, the furtherance of the agreement the prosecutor was looking for. And for a guy with natural selection plastered everywhere, he's trying to, he's trying to do what they did, but better. Tomorrow night, just before 6, in an exclusive interview with New Center 16, Russell Frantum is speaking out about his life seven years ago, from how he got involved in this online plot to the investigation and charges against him. When I asked him how he looks back at 2008 and everything that happened, he says it's like looking at a completely different person. At the time, his attorney claimed the emails, the MySpace posts, everything were theoretical and theatrical. But despite the charges of conspiracy to commit murder, to this day, Frantum insists he would not have gone through with it. So at the time, I was dealing with lots of unhappy things. And For I was Russell able Frantum, to now 23, there's always been something fascinating about true crime. I was definitely in too deep with all this stuff. His teenage room, a reflection of his interests. Horror films, weapons, serial killers, even a blood-like smearing of red paint. But that was Russell, a self-proclaimed oddball, even at a young age. I wasn't popular by any means. I was very different from the other people, but I, you know, really it was more of a, it was more of a home situation issue. Seven I, years ago, law enforcement I, argued I Russell's okay. fascination with violence came dangerously close to becoming a reality. It just got way out of hand. In April 2008, the St. Joseph County Prosecutor's Office charged Russell with conspiracy to commit murder. And sort of evaluate really what we're looking at in this individual for planning a mass shooting at one of the area's largest schools, Penn High School. I won't deny that everything that I did was completely wrong. His life seven years ago was much different. His father, for whom he's named, was out of the picture, and he moved out of his mother's home to live with his grandfather and uncle. Just months before his arrest, his grandfather's passing sent Russell spiraling down a very dark path. When he passed away, that took a lot out of me. I, you know, started to dabble in things that weren't healthy and weren't correct. I didn't have anyone to help me go through that, that phase. The internet, in all of its anonymity, gave Russell an outlet. He ran a MySpace group full of like-minded members who sympathized with the Columbine shooters. I started talking to someone who I absolutely knew nothing about. It's on that site that Russell engaged in this virtual plot. I don't believe that I ever would have gone through with anything, no. He claims he knew very little about the man later charged as his co-conspirator, Lee Billy from Lakewood, Ohio. But throughout their conversations, the two discussed a very morbid plan. That just kind of took off. Within a matter of days, they developed code, referring to a public shooting as a party and guns and bombs as party favors. It just happened, it happened so quick. Investigators determined it happened in about a week. Wasn't, you know, aware really of the things I was saying and how serious they were. And it's obvious when people are posting things that are of that nature that someone's going to react that way. And I definitely don't blame them. To Russell, those conversations were theoretical, merely fantasy. It was mainly theatrically speaking. During a second interview, Russell explained some of the evidence collected by police, a handwritten notebook, and online chat records, which police took as threats. Russell said he didn't really mean. I remember writing a lot of messed up things, a lot of things that make absolutely no sense to me now, that I was um, just out looking for attention. While police took these at face value, Russell insists he got in over his head trapped in a rapidly unfolding dialogue with a man he didn't know. That's the worst thing that I did, was talking to him, because how do I know? How do I know if he's really going to do it or not? See, that's, that, is the, that is the scary part of the, my past and what I did. He served less than a year in juvenile detention, released rather suddenly when his program was completed. I felt like for the first time I could find out who I was who the real me was, and not just what I was, you know, picking up on because of the crap that I was 
going through. Now he's an artist using painting to help him through the tough times. Seven years ago, prosecutors put their faith in the juvenile justice system and decided not to try then 16-year-old Russell Franton as an adult. Their hope that he'd get the rehabilitation needed to turn his life around. Experts say school shooters and individuals with personality disorders never get 100% better, so to speak. They're stabilized, but Russell says he's found an outlet through art. The eyes are the windows into the soul. These eyes, colorful, dark, distorted, are a reflection, an imprint of their creator. Basically everything that I do is a self-portrait. Behind each brushstroke, a word in Russell Frantim's artistic diary. We were first introduced to Frantim in April. At the time, he stumbled upon a masterpiece at Goodwill. I have a Hyacinth Kohler 1972 piece. But what we didn't realize about him was his darker past. At that time, I was dealing with a lot of emotional issues, and I decided that I would start doing art, and I just, I loved the way that it made me feel. His name never released, but his story made national headlines in 2008. The Penn High School freshman who planned a Columbine-like attack and got caught. I won't deny that everything that I did was completely wrong, and was, I was definitely not in my right mind at the time. He served roughly nine months in juvenile detention, not angry about his sentence, if anything, reflective. I got better. I started feeling better, and for the first time in my life, I felt free. Using his incarceration to sort out exactly who he was. Discovering deep down he had quite the artistic soul. It's a method of therapy for me and it keeps me happy for the most part. I don't have to worry about art judging me. If I make a mistake in art, I can fix it easily. If you make mistakes in life, you know, they follow you forever, sometimes. Each painting he completes in one sitting, afraid that should he leave and come back, his emotional state would be completely different. Emotions are emotions, they're never wrong. It's what we do with them that's the problem. Dr. Erin Leonard is a psychotherapist who specializes in adolescents and children. In her research, she looks at emotional trauma and what makes kids tick. So if you look at all the school shootings in, in the history of the United States, all of them involve a child who um, felt rejected on a mass level by society. In these cases, personality disorders and fragile egos drive a need for validation. It's a very distorted sense of reality, and so that's something that's important, you know, for therapists and parents and coaches and teachers to work with, too, is to really, in a very empathic, gentle way, you know, steer them back to what is very realistic. Empathy is key. Children who aren't taught or shown empathy, who already have disordered personalities, often turn their fixations on things like violence. And a killer is the most powerful person out there. Everyone's afraid of a killer. Everyone's afraid of a shooter. And so for a child who feels small and weak and helpless and rejected and worthless, and if they do have a personality disorder, what they're going to do is they're going to imitate and emulate someone who is super powerful so they can feel that powerful. So how do you avoid this? Well, there's no one-step fix. It's a process. You know, validating, um, you know, anger or disappointment or hurt and then correcting a behavior or disciplining a behavior you know that is much more effective than you know asking your child to stifle those feelings but for Frantum his fascination with crime and weapons went in the wrong direction there were things that I was looking for as far as ventilation and expressing myself saying things that I maybe couldn't normally say I very badly needed someone that could be there and talk to me and listen now he thanks art for rehabilitating him. Take a look at his paintings. This 2014 watercolor entitled Guilty of Murder. Or this self-portrait Phantom calls, I don't think I'll be around for much longer. Those dripping tears have become his signature. Russell's art, a form of expression, an insight into his life, and an outlet for his thoughts.